Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me once again David McElvaney. And uh, before we go any further, I would like to just uh, have you jot down the website. It's McElvaney weeklycommentary.com I think is where you should go Mac, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y weeklycommentary.com at least I suggest you go there to listen to David's weekly commentary because it's very valuable download it listen to it and uh, enjoy it profit from it and uh, and I think you won't be sorry for taking some time to do that David uh, is the president of the McIlvaney Financial Companies McIlvaney Wealth Management and the ICA that's a 36 year old precious metals brokerage firm uh, he is a graduate of Biola University and Oxford University where he studied philosophy and political theory. Uh, but since then, he has uh, become a very seasoned professional, uh, having gained expertise in, in finance and uh, in the markets with Morgan Stanley in California. And then more recently, taking over his family's business, which has been dedicated uh, to truly serving the needs of, of, of a large number of people in various ways and uh, helping them with their financial needs. But the McIlvaney legacy, uh, David's legacy and his family legacy is more than just about financial markets and material needs. Indeed, David and his father before him know that the increasing chaos that is taking place in the global economy and the really guttural sort of display of uh, existing political campaign here in America have, have its roots really in the spiritual realm. And David is one of the few financial professionals that I know of these days who understands that connection between the spiritual, uh, you know, the, the orders that our creator gave us, the way we're supposed to live our lives, and how affluence can spring forth from that. It doesn't mean that if we are uh, following a, a Christian uh, viewpoint that we're going to necessarily be wealthy and material uh, material ways, but it does mean that we will have a, our lives ordered in a way that will allow us to provide and share and give and serve others. And and I think that's much of what David and his father before him uh, have been about in their lives, which is really one of the reasons I'm really happy to have David with me again. Thanks for joining me again, David. Great to be with you, Jay. Always enjoy our conversations. I always do, off mic as well as on mic. And I would just say, uh, did I give the right place for people to go, McIlvaney Weekly Commentary dot com or is there a simpler one? Yeah, McIlvaney dot com. When people want to yeah, when people want to know what we're thinking about market related things, the commentary site is great. Uh, if they have any interest in the book that I'm just printing and uh, taking to the market, uh, they can go to David dot com and it has information on the book and ordering and things like that. So um, David dot com for the book and uh, commentary. Of course, our conversations are usually relating to the markets and things like that. Um, so wh- wh- wherever wherever they want to spend time is great. Okay, great. Well, the name of the book is the Intentional Legacy, uh, and we want to get into that, David. Uh, but before we get into your book, I, we'll try to save that. I think it's the best for last. Uh, I would like to focus on some current issues that are very disturbing, at least to me as an as an old guy. You know, I'm closer to your father's age than to your age, probably. And I, you know, I can remember as a grade school kid, uh, Eisenhower was my president at that time. Times were much different. We still were on a on a gold standard, uh, at least an international gold standard at that point in time. There weren't credit cards yet, and people actually saved before they consumed, uh, and that was sort of the the. Uh, the way I was brought up, at least in the early years, until the 60s and 70s, things sort of changed uh, in the culture of our country. Um, but in any event, um, David, I've titled today's show, Can, Can America's Superior Military Perpetuate U.S. Dishonest Hegemony Forever? And, you know, uh, in your last weekly podcast, which I strongly suggest people listen to, that one and, and future ones, that one that I listened to recently, you talked about the Philippines and how the new leader of that country has not only used some very uncomplimentary language to describe our president, but has essentially turned against the United States and has really in, in trade relations and has said, you know, basically told the United States to get lost and has uh, said that he's going to pledge his allegiance now to China. You know, and that's after we've had a long history with the Philippines. The United States has had a long history of uh, rela- you know of, of trade relations, military alliances, and so forth with with the Philippines. Um, what do you think is going on here? What what's, what drove the Philippines and this new leader to thumb his nose at the United States? Yeah, I think there's a growing sense amongst 
the emerging markets and uh, markets that are not not in the G8 or even in the G20 that perhaps they need to reconsider who they're aligning themselves with and perhaps they want to be more closely aligned with the up-and-coming power as opposed to the has-been. Um, mm. We don't know for sure how history will be written, but at least this piece is clear. Duterte in the last week or two announcing his separation from the United States. And, you know, for a man that came into office in June, following major agreements that we had with the Filipino government, the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement in March of this year, it looks like those are just sort of scraps of paper worth nothing today because he's he's moving quickly towards the embrace of the Chinese um, massive partnership with them, and um, we give expectations and exhortations, and we tell people what to do and how to do it. And mm. the Chinese, on the other hand, are saying, "How much money do you need?" And mm. uh, by the way, we really don't have strings attached. Now, that's not altogether true. There's right. no strings attached, but um, you know, twenty-four billion dollars is on the table, and the Philippines has the opportunity to do some different things and go a different direction. Well, David, the United States can print money out of nothing, an un- unlimited amount, seemingly, after 2008, 2009, trillions of dollars created out of thin air. Uh, can't we continue to do that I think and, we're very and, and uncertain. compete with the Chinese? I think we're very uncertain as to our role as an empire, and mm-hmm. nobody wants to admit that we have one. We've not <laughs> operated as one of the empires of, of, of the years or or, or decades past where, you know, you you basically controlled the world, we are looking for influence. And what we're seeing is our influence is being eroded and where we might have had influence previously. I mean, consider the Philippines has been a part of the U.S. nexus since 1898 at the end of of a massive conflict, the Spanish-American War, and up until 1946 uh, was actually... um, Hours, you could say. And Mm -hmm. so for them to move away, I think it's just, it's a symptom. And for a thoughtful investor, you'd have to say, are are the countries that we have relied upon in the past going to be reliable in the future? And I think that is very interesting when we think about financing our deficits. Uh, The Middle East has been a part of that, recirculating trade dollars, petrodollars, and, and more recently China recirculating trade dollars in the U.S. Treasuries. As those appetites wane and as as politicians, new politicians come in with a new perspective, I think we're going to have to fight for what was uh, a foregone conclusion. We are the greatest empire in the world today. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to fight, you mean literally with with military might? You know, it was very interesting. Juan Zarate, uh, formerly with the Treasury Department, wrote a fascinating book called Treasury's War just a few years ago, and in it he highlights how we've brought the tools of the Treasury into the modern battlefield, and that tanks and bombs and guns are a bit passe. We can fight fights uh, through liquidity and capital flows far more effectively, and if we have an enemy, we can make sure that they feel the noose tighten uh, from the standpoint of capital flows very effectively using the Treasury as the new War Department. And so uh, I'm not sure that it will be a military conflict, but I think certainly the Treasury has been and will continue to be involved. We've been using that against Russia, it seems. How effective do you think it's been? Um, yeah, I think, I think we've, to some degree, been effective. Um, it hasn't endeared them to us at all, of course. Um, we use the same strategy and tactics with Iran. And I think really what we're doing is we're creating a whole group of people that dislike us more and more and are Mm -hmm. just more open to cooperating amongst themselves and finding workarounds to the systems that we have in place. Well, it certainly seems to be the case with Russia and and China, and you wonder about the BRICS and the uh, the new Silk Road that we've had. um, uh, I don't know if you know the historian William Engdahl, F. William Engdahl. He's been a guest on this show a number of times, written a number of books, and he fo- his focus is largely on the rising, you know, the the rising Eastern powers, the the China and 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 the uh, the amazing infrastructure that's being put, not only physical infrastructure, railroads and uh, and uh, transportation infrastructure, but also, of course. Uh, the financial infrastructures that they are putting in place to compete against the IMF or uh, the World Bank and uh, the, what I call the Anglo 
uh, the the Anglo American uh, Empire, and um, you wonder just you know how I mean how far this can go and and uh, and how long it can it can go on, David, because we you know it, it, nobody is really experiencing what what you'd say is sound economics or sound market driven economics. Certainly not the United States, uh, China certainly not. But how do you account for the ascension of of countries like China that are certainly not free market com- countries at all? And how do you account for the demise of our economy, which is certainly not doing very well, to say the least? Well, we've moved in the direction here in the States towards a command and control economy where prices are fixed and stock and bond markets are essentially nationalized. And ironically, over the last 20, 30 years, China has moved from a complete command and control economy to something that has many of the characteristics of capitalism, even though their structures are still in place with the Politburo. I think it's very interesting to watch what's taken place since the steam engine emerged on the scene. We had the world which was sort of facing eastward prior to the invention of the steam engine, and after that... Um, you look at port development in Hamburg and, and sort of the redirection of the whole world westward, mm. and we benefited from that for 100 years. The, the notion that you described earlier, the Silk Road, what they're calling the One Belt, One Road Project, mm-hmm. is, is again an attempt to reorient things back to the east and basically capture a European interest um, and redirect it towards China and a major economic development zone where not only energy but goods and services focus on uh, the resources of that country. So uh, we could be seeing a similar shift, frankly, and and these things don't happen overnight, Um, but I think over the next 10 to 15 years, you're likely to see our market share in terms of the global economy erode and uh, a greater market share shift in the direction of China. I want to talk a little bit uh, about your book, Have You Talk About uh, the International or the Intentional Legacy. your you, you intentional legacy you're talking about is a family legacy. Uh, why is it such? Why is it so important? Um, well, first of all, maybe you can just discuss what you mean by a legacy. When you know, I think of legacies like the American Airlines as a legacy, or I think of legacies of very important people. We think of uh, you know the Rockefellers, Ford, perhaps uh, the Rothschilds, people that have you know been very have had major impacts, uh, visible impacts at least, on society. But what, what are you talking about when you're talking about legacy? I gather in looking at your book, you're talking about family legacies to a great extent. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's a Large or small. You can, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. it, it, you can look at it from the standpoint of a financial legacy. That's tangible assets. That's real physical stuff. And, of course, those wealthy families best exhibit that. Um, but there's other kinds of legacy uh, which speak to the values of a person, um, you know, the, the uh, courage that a soldier exhibits on the battlefield is a part of his own personal legacy. There's mm-hmm. virtues and values expressed in, in action each day that have nothing to do with money. And I think what that opens up is a broader definition of the concept of legacy. And I think it's very important because not everyone has billions of dollars um, some people don't even have two nickels to rub together, and yet they can leave an amazing legacy. And I think for those families who do have resources, it's important to recognize that there is a foundation which needs to be built for those physical, tangible assets to be transferred from one generation to the next with great success. And that requires managing a different set of resources. So we would shift our emphasis from tangible asset, man- asset management to intangible asset management. Now we're talking about matters of the heart, matters of the mind. We're talking about matters of family identity and the things that you choose each day to create a family identity, which really set the stage for any subsequent uh, transfer of assets uh, on a larger scale. So that's a deeply personal issue, and it's, it's something that every family has to look at and say, we will leave a legacy are we happy with what we're going to leave? Have we been intentional enough about what we want to be uh, moving from one generation to the next? I make the case that legacy is something that you build every day, not necessarily something that you leave at the end of your life, but mm-hmm. you're involved in the, the work of legacy every day. 
sitting around having a conversation about the latest political debate, sitting around having a conversation about the book that you're reading or that your kids or grandkids are, are, are going through, issues that they struggle with, questions that they have about life. These are things that are so fundamental, unfortunately, so basic, that I think sometimes they're overlooked. I do, too, and I think basically most of us don't, uh, you know, as you point out in your book, I, I believe you point out that whether you like it or not, you're going to have a legacy. It's not something you can get away from. You're, you're going to have your, your kids and people that come after you are going to remember you or are going to be, and their very lives will be shaped to, a, to an extent uh, by, your, by what you've done and how you've lived your life and so forth. Um, so you can't really get away from it, right? Everybody's got one, but I think that how many people are really intentional about their legacy? I mean, I think, you know, probably really wealthy people who want to make sure their their kids get married to the right people and so on and so forth. They think about their legacy. They think about where they're going in the future. Most of us sort of think that we're just insignificant people here, that we're not really, that our lives aren't really that important, uh, that we should even be concerned about our legacy. We're just here. You know, it's, we're just accidents that happen to be here. There's no purpose in our lives. I mean, isn't that the way a lot of people feel? It is the way people feel, and it's one of the ways in which I think we're fumbling an opportunity, and, and that is that each individual has immense value and worth who they are as individuals, and, and sharing who they are as individuals with their family is, is so much a part of who we are. I, I think of my father, I think of my grandparents, and I think of all that I have gleaned from them through the years. Jay, I wouldn't be who I am without Don, without... I can name a dozen men and women who came before me, and I am borrowing their capital. I am borrowing the lessons learned and the battles that they have fought through years and years of struggle to grow and develop as individuals. And all of that collective wisdom is a part of who I am. It, my legacy and theirs, really, is the sum total of their life message. It's not a balance sheet. It's not a balance sheet, unless you want to include on your balance sheet both intangibles and tangibles. But I recognize that my inclination to um, be courageous in certain instances or be generous in certain instances, this is not something that, that just spontaneously emerges out of me, but I saw it demonstrated by my mother and father and grandparents. And to the degree that these are the things that we talk about, we're cultivating values that create a culture that I think we're proud of. And, you know, so to look and say, we've got serious issues, not only in our country politically, um, but around the world, there's, there's something that's not quite right. And if you scratch very deep, very deep beneath the surface, you'll find that there are major cultural issues, there are major moral issues, ultimately there's major spiritual issues. And, well, again, we, we're more concerned about the latest version of the iPhone uh, then, then we are sitting down and gleaning from our parents and grandparents the things that will ultimately be of greatest benefit uh, to us as we live our lives, uh, hopefully, with great wisdom. All right, David, with just uh, less than a minute left to go, how can we discover what our legacy is indiv- as individuals? Can you do that in 30 seconds? <laughs> It, yeah, absolutely. I think this is this really is like an accounting function. One of the first things that you do is create a balance sheet of assets and liabilities, and with gratefulness in your heart, look at the things that are both an asset to you, they've been great benefits to you, and the things that you would say, this is real baggage, and I wish I didn't have it from my parents and grandparents. And the accounting function is so important because you have to start somewhere, and to the degree that you want to set a different trajectory for your family you must know the place from which you're starting. So I think creating a balance sheet, an asset and liability balance sheet, and listing the things that have been immeasurably helpful and the things that have been immeasurably harmful, uh, again, not to castigate past generations or shame them, but to recognize that if you're not careful, you can perpetuate pain from one generation to the next unnecessarily. And And you can also do... yeah. You, you can also do positive things. You can you, you can pass along the positive from one generation to the next. David, we are we are out of time. I'm I'm very sorry. There's so much more to talk to you about. I just can't recommend enough the intentional 
legacy by David McIlvaney. Uh, this this transcends the, the material. We usually talk about gold and things, and David would love to have you back to talk about that. I know you believe in honest money. People should be uh, should should have on their balance sheets gold, but these intangible balance sheets that are so important also in allowing us to enjoy our lives and and becoming the best persons that we can be that God intended us to be when he created us. So, uh, uh, David, I want to thank you very much for being with us, and we'll look to do it again sometime in the near future. And again, uh, folks, pick up The inter- the Intentional Legacy. David, where, again, they should go to buy this book directly? Uh, the Intentional Legacy, if you go to davidmcilvaney.com, davidmcilvaney.com, you can order that um, and have it in time for Christmas conversation with family about the things that really matter. 